Thank you. Excited to see the full room. So today we're going to talk about open telemetry, and we'll go beyond getting started. Uh, I'm Sergey from Microsoft. I'm Morgan, product manager at Google. Uh, so this is an advanced session. We're not going to do the usual spiel about the power of observability and what tracing is and all that. Uh, I think there's probably been other sessions at this conference that cover that. Uh, we're diving into how to actually use open telemetry and how to use instrumentation to solve specific scenarios in your application. However, in case you're in the wrong room or, or you just came in here for fun, uh, open telemetry provides, uh, makes robust portable telemetry a built-in feature of cloud-native software. What that actually means is that we give you a way to extract signals and metrics and relevant telemetry information from your application so you can then send them to a backend for processing. We don't do the backend part. We're not Prometheus. We're not Jaeger. We're just the components that you add to your application to get that telemetry out. Open telemetry has a few core components. Uh, probably the most core is the APIs themselves. We define interfaces across, I think, eight or nine different languages uh, that describe uh, application metrics, distributed traces, uh, environmental metadata, and so on. Uh, and so these APIs are how you can actually describe those things in order for them to be exported. We next offer integrations. Integrations are often overlooked, but they're in many ways one of the most important components of open telemetry. These integrations are the reason why when you start using open telemetry and you're using an HTTP library or a gRPC or a storage client, that you don't have to go and instrument those yourselves. You don't have to go and write a create your own latency metrics for your various endpoints because we offer integrations that do that for you. And that's the real power of the project. Next, we have libraries. These are actual implementations. Open Telemetry allows you to bring your own implementation if you want, but we also have a single set of standard implementations that we expect most people are probably going to use. Uh, these libraries take care, th take care of things like distributed trace context propagation. Uh, they take care of sampling. They take care of all of the sort of nasty bits that you really don't want to have to implement yourself time and time again. Uh, finally, we have exporters. Exporters will send uh, the data that you capture, the data that you've defined, to your back end of choice. That might be Prometheus, it might be Jaeger, might be one of, various, uh, one of many various commercial uh, offerings. And we have uh, collectors. We're not going to dive too much into the collector in this session. Uh, there were some uh, pretty good conversations about the collector at the observability talk uh, on Monday. Uh, the collector is something you can run as a network service or an agent. Uh, it can do things from just proxying the telemetry that you're collecting and sending it to different uh, backends, uh, or it can capture system metrics and, and, and things like that. But we're not going to dive into too much of that during this talk. It's me. Ah, that's you. That's why I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> As Morgan said, Open Telemetry provides a full solution, a full um, solution for telemetry collection, and. Um, if you add Jaeger or Zipkin or Prometheus, you get complete insight into application behavior through distributed tracing and metrics. If you add some managed solution from one of the commercial vendors, uh, be it Azure Monitor, Google Stack Driver, I wouldn't mention all other vendors working with us, but uh, add those and you'll get uh, full, stack, uh, full stack monitoring with a turnkey uh, managed backend. Uh, this is telemetry flow from, uh, through the components of, of open telemetry. API gets signal from application and then translates the signals into SDK, and SDK uh, treats the signals as a telemetry item. So it has a uh, telemetry model. And then this uh, telemetry being pushed through the processor and exporter pipeline to out of application process to collector. Then collector, uh, decide, like, massage the data, process it, and reach this data, um, and then send it to uh, one of the backend of your choice using collectors. So open telemetry is a complete solution. You don't need any other components. You may find all of them on this diagram. But providing a full solution, we still allow a lot of room for innovation. So we're, saying we're providing all these extensibility points so you can extend every single of these components or completely replace them. When we talk, look at uh, extensibility and we design extensibility, we try to stri strike a balance between being flexible and being powerful out of the box. We're trying to, um, uh, if you look at extensibility points, we'll look at them from right to left. Uh, first extensibility point is uh, ability to configure collector to send data to various backends. It's a very easy, uh, uh, extensibility. It's very easy to use, and you can configure that at any uh, 
moment of your application lifecycle because it's configured out of process in the collector process. Second extensibility point is the uh, ability to configure collector to uh, process your data the way you need to process it. You can aggregate certain metrics uh, and don't aggregate others. You can filter spans. You can uh, enrich telemetry with additional attributes. All those is available through configuration. Third extensibility point is an uh, interesting one. Uh, sometimes in your environment, you cannot install additional collector, additional process or sidecar to run and process your telemetry. In this case, you need an uh, experter from inside the process communicating directly to the backend of your choice. Fourth extensibility point is the same sampling and processing and uh, uh, enriching of telemetry that you saw in collector, but this one is happening in process. Sometimes you need to do it because of performance reasons, and sometimes some attrib attributes that you want to associate with your telemetry are simply not available in the collector. And finally, fifth and the most uh, extreme extensibility point is the ability to completely replace entire SDK and whole stack of uh, telemetry processing to something completely new. Like you can rewrite the entire stack. And the reason for this extensibility point is that our inspiration is to make telemetry a built-in feature of every application. So you don't want to lock you into solution of telemetry processing or the data model we use. You want to uh, allow you to get the signals from your application and put it into form you, uh, you want. Some examples of this extensibility is telemetry systems that operate on raw events. Uh, we typically operate with a span that uh, represents the duration of time, but some systems only operate on start event of a span and end event of a span. You want, we want to enable this uh, type of extensibility for these vendors. While we enable all these extensibility points, we truly believe that uh, most of you will never need all of them. You may, probably will be fine with like a few APIs, and we want to make sure that we have all these APIs easy to use, easy to configure, and easy to understand. Uh, typically, when you look at open telemetry, you can have this like uh, one of the most uh, uh, useful API for end users will be just to configure SDK, get the Lego blocks of uh, monitoring components and uh, put them all together. Uh, then another API will be uh, to provide these Lego blocks, to build them, to instrument your libraries, to instrument third-party libraries. Uh, uh, finally, you, can, you may want to fine-tune telemetry that you collect. And this is a processing uh, API, processing enrichment API. And some APIs, like Experter API, will mostly be used by telemetry vendors. Uh, and we're not going to cover it in this talk. With this, I want to uh, switch to Morgan to make a, a getting started demo, like how to get started with open telemetry. All right, so we're going to show a very simple example of how to get started, and then we're going to go into the beyond getting started part that you were promised in the title of this session. Uh, so for getting started, we have a common scenario. We have a client that calls a server. Uh, we're just going to do this single two-hop scenario. Uh, there are obviously bigger examples. If you have 10 microservices, you'll have a client that calls a server, which has a client that calls another server, and so on. We're just doing a simplified version, but we're going to show context propagation for tracing and how easy it is to get started. So like I said, client calls a server. Server sends a response to the client. The, uh, for those who are less familiar with distributed tracing, the client is going to create something called a span that tracks the amount of processing time done on the client and other, other metadata. The server will then generate its own span, which will be, of course, shorter than the client span, uh, and it'll be a child of it. And the context, that sort of trace ID we propagate between both, is how on the back end in Jaeger we know to stitch those together. So let me change inputs and go to the demo. What I have here, is that big enough for everyone? I hear nothing, so I assume it's fine. Um, what we have here is a very basic Node.js application. We have a client and a server. We're looking at the client code right now. Um, it's our Hello World example. This is on our uh, OpenTelemetry JavaScript GitHub. And it is quite literally what you expect. You have a client here. It makes a request to localhost for the Hello World endpoint. Uh, and just waits for a response. And on the server side, uh, it spins for about two seconds and then responds to it. Very, very simple. The only thing that we've done here, the only code that we have that is specific to OpenTelemetry is that we've imported 
the core OpenTelemetry JavaScript library, and then we've just told it to set up the tracer and exporters for the HTTP client service. At no point do we generate a custom span. At no point do we have to handle sampling or context propagation or anything else. This is all done automatically through the integrations that are built into OpenTelemetry. This is the real power of the project. Uh, you don't need to do any of this boilerplate code yourself. And so, we'll get this running. The server code is remarkably similar. So we got the server running, got the client running, and we'll go over to Jaeger, which was already running in the background, actually has some traces already captured. And if we hop into one of those traces we'd already captured, we refresh it if we want to see a new one. There we go. Yeah, make it real. Yeah, like this is this is live running. I've got two captured in the back uh, in the background just in case things go wrong. But uh, this this is the trace that we literally just sent in, and we can see the two spans that we expect. We've got a root span here for the client that's just tracking the the operations happening on the clients. It then sent out a request, and we can see the operations happening on the server. As we can see, the difference between latency on these is incredibly small. They're both running on localhost. Obviously, it's going to be pretty quick. But this simple example is powerful because it, we can see how little code, how few code changes are required to take place. I had to import a library and tell it, I'm using HTTP, go use HTTP. Very, with just a couple seconds of work, we got this to happen automatically. And we've done it also in a way where it's linked through source control and we can manage it ourselves, we can roll it forward, roll it back. Okay, so as promised, this session is titled Beyond Getting Started. So what we're gonna do for the next, uh, next 20 minutes, roughly, is walk through different scenarios that you as developers are gonna commonly run into and show you how you handle these with open telemetry and talk about best practices. Uh, the first of these scenarios is a, basically based on what we just did. We have a client, the client calls the server, but there's a long running task on the server. Uh, in the scenario here, it's once again, it's just there's a sleep statement for two seconds. Uh, but you can imagine a workload, you know, in your everyday job where you have something, you know, a chain of requests, and one of the services that that chain passes through has something that takes some time, something that is worth tracking independently, and you can create your own span for it so that every time a trace goes through that service, you can, you can actually analyze how long that long running operation took. Generally, you won't need to do this. If you have a chain of a few services that are doing very quick, very repeatable tasks, there's no point in adding any custom instrumentation. But sometimes there is. So I'm gonna cut back to my demo. And we're gonna look at the server code. So like I said, the server is similar to the client. We imported OpenTelemetry Core. We put on the same, H uh, we uh, then imported the HTTP server uh, instrumentation. And because we want to add some custom instrumentation, we have to add a little bit of code, right? OpenTelemetry can't magically determine what you think is worth tracking, and so as a developer, you have to tell it. So the first thing we're gonna do is create a reference to the tracer. This is just something, this is just an instance uh, of the API that we need to actually uh, communicate with OpenTelemetry. We then actually go and create a span. So we define the span here. Uh, we get the current span that was already captured by the automatic instrumentation, and then we're gonna create another child span on top of it. Uh, we also log what we're doing, and we just tell it to create the child span. Now, of course, a span has a duration. It tracks, you know, a start and end of an event, so we also need to close the, event, close the span. So here, once we've finished our little timeout, or our two-second uh, sleep statement, we tell it to end the span and then continue what it was doing. And here, just in case of, if there's an error, we do the same thing. So I'll save this. I'll then um, shut down the client, run it again. Okay, client's running, and we'll go back to our trace list, search it again, and here we are. Oh, well, that's not supposed to look like that. It's a good thing I had already had a tab open. Um, so this is the three spans that we expect to get that from that operation. So we've got the two spans that were automatically captured from our HTTP requests through our services, and we've got an additional one that's tracking the long-running process on this machine. With just a few lines of code, we've not only gotten the automatic instrumentation, we've not only got tracing and context propagation and all that hard, hard stuff done, we've added custom telemetry to our application that we can then analyze so that if there's a slowdown or some sort of performance issue, we can use this to find out why it's slow. And with that, I think, Sergey, you're gonna talk about a few additional scenarios. So we just learned how, to, how easy it is to enable uh, open telemetry, 
and uh, how easy it is to collect spans, be it automatically or manually through code instrumentation. So now we will talk about scenarios and there will be a lot of back and forth, so I probably will stand, be standing there and uh, talking about scenario first and uh, then switching to code. First scenario I want to talk, cover is, uh, I want to say that not all spans made equal. Sometimes you have some health endpoint and this endpoint is constantly bombarded with millions of requests and all of them are 200 OK. And they're typically very fast, very sm uh, small and uh, telemetry produced by monitoring this request is, uh, can hide real user problems. And also it costs you money. So sometimes you want to filter it out. You can filter telemetry out on multiple components of open telemetry, if you remember the diagram. You can do it in collector, but in this particular example, I will show you how to implement custom sampler to filter it out on very early stage before sample uh, span is, or is uh, even created. And another uh, thing that I want to say, there'll be a switch of uh, environments. We start with Node.js, and it's not like I don't like Node.js, I just have a point to make, and I make it in like, five minutes, I think, so wait for it, and I'm switching to .NET. And while Sergey sets it up, uh, OpenSlimetry uh, already has great support uh, for tracing on Node, Python, Java, Go, and .NET, uh, and we've got other languages that are in the pipe uh, following that very shortly. So it's as easy to enable OpenTelemetry for .NET as for any other languages. Uh, you import a bunch of packages and then uh, add this uh, few statements. So in this particular example, I want to monitor uh, incoming requests and I want to send them to Zipkin and I configure Zipkin endpoint. That's it, you have telemetry. So now like, uh, I want to compile this application, run it really quick and I will uh, hit a health endpoint. So first uh, default endpoint uh, weather forecast will be opened and then I hit health. And now I want to prove to you that uh, uh, telemetry was actually collected. So I go to Zipkin. You remember I configure Zipkin. And uh, it will show me in a second two spans, one for weather forecast and other for health. I can prove you that it's health. So you see. Um, so now I switch back uh, to my application. I want to configure sampling to filter those out. Let's close it. And um, uh, it's very easy to enable sampling. I will use custom sampler because uh, open telemetry doesn't know which endpoints are synthetic as health endpoints. Uh, my custom sampler will answer the question, should I sample? Method name uh, is very uh, descriptive. And um, based on the name of a span, I either uh, return decision false, please don't sample, or I pass the decision to another sampler that will be, uh, make more advanced uh, decisions. So, Looking at this code, you, you basically, uh, you basically uh, filtering out all the health uh, data and uh, you don't care about it. So uh, switching back, I just need to enable the sampler for my application and, uh, and I run again. So now weather endpoint will open first and then I'll uh, hit the health endpoint and in Zipkin we'll also, we will only see uh, weather endpoint. This is a scenario I know that we see a lot, uh, certainly even if applications I've written on my own, is just not wanting to sample health, health checks because it f pollutes the, the tracing data that you've captured. So 200 OK, empty page, and switching to Zipkin. Wi-Fi is not great here. Oh yeah, it's still loading. Okay, so you only see one endpoint and it's we uh, weather forecast endpoint. Okay, now switch back to the slides. So this was first uh, first scenario. Uh, we filtered out certain spans. Now I want to talk about how to make spans more useful. So we increase ROI, return on investments of collecting the spans and paying uh, for, for storing them in, a, uh, in our telemetry system. Uh, very often you want to attribute your spans 
with additional attributes. So you may want to have some business details associated with incoming request, or you may do attribute a session that user uh, browsed with. It's very easy to do in uh, open telemetry, and many examples of manual instrumentation are quite straightforward. You have a start span, you have end span, and you have span object to add attributes for. In this sample, I want to add attribute to automatically collected uh, span. So you don't worry about enabling data collection. You're pretty sure that spans will be collected. You just want to add more information on the span. So coming back to the um, application here, um, I will uh, switch to controller. What I want to say here is, um, there is multiple ways to add attributes to, to your application. This, uh, this one is extremely easy and extremely straightforward. So you, don't, you probably will figure it out on your own very quickly, just looking at our documentation. So I get a tracer out of de dependency injection here, and I access current span. Current span was already created by uh, open telemetry automatic data collection. So I just take it and uh, put an attribute for it. So let's run it, and uh, in Zipkin, uh, we will open the span, and we will see the new attribute associated with the span. Almost there. Okay. So I go back, and uh, yeah, this is a new span, less than a minute ago, and uh, for sure it has a new uh, attribute. You see, you can increase the, uh, um, value of spans automatically collected by open telemetry by simply putting new attributes on it. But not all attributes are made equal. Some attributes are very special. Some attributes describing your application or the process this application running into. So you can have, um, these attributes are very special, not because they're global for the process, but because you want to associate these attributes with all the telemetry you have on the system, with all the metrics, with all the logs, with all the spans. So you don't want to write a line of code saying current span attribute, current metric attribute. You just want to set it globally for every uh, telemetry source to consume. And it's very easy to do uh, in our example. So let's go back into code. This is wrong screen. Uh, let's go back to the code, and then um, we're here. I go back to a startup file, because this is global attributes, and I set it once for the process. Um, I'll uncomment a couple of lines here. This is like set attributes method. You see, I can, um, I created new resource, and I uh, associated a few properties with it. Uh, some properties are just custom, like I just came up with it. Like we don't know about deployment tenant ID, just like random name. Some properties are very special. We have a semantic for that, and we have specification explaining the semantics. So what I'm gonna do, I wanna, since I added this special property here, I just gonna comment out this property here, because every exporter knows the semantics, and it knows that service name needs to be taken from resource API. When I run this example, uh, weather endpoint will open, and uh, what we'll see is that spans will still be delivered to Zipkin to the same application name, backend app, even though I commented it out. And then they will have additional attribute, um, uh, say, in deployment tenant ID. Go back. Here we go, it's already here. Um, you see, it's the same application name, and there is a deployment tenant ID here. Know that uh, some system will have a special meaning for those properties because they're global. Some don't. Like Zipkin doesn't have special meaning for that, so we just put it into a set of uh, uh, default name value pairs. And finally, uh, not finally, we have more. <laughs> So resource attributes are very special attributes because they spawn entire uh, process. But there is another dimension that the attributes can spawn into, and this dimension is uh, request dimension. So entire request may have the same uh, set of attributes associated with it. And flight ID for feature flight is a good example of it. So imagine you have A-B testing, and you have a certain feature you want to test. Uh, the way to test a feature is not only click it through, but also uh, look at telemetry produced by uh, this uh, flight. 
So those attributes not only spawn across all telemetry items as a dimension for metric and as a uh, span attributes, but also they, uh, uh, they typically involve some uh, additional sampling logic that needs to be uh, taken uh, flight IDs into account. You don't want to lose a telemetry from a single flight when flight is only 1% of, ex uh, like set up for only 1% of exposure. So to set, cast, uh, to set this type of attributes, we have a different API called uh, distributed context and it's scoping API. So you start, you set a scope of, uh, of this attribute and then you end the scope of this attribute and all the telemetry inside of the scope will be attributed with this uh, ID. I will show you really quick. Um, uh, this example and uh, I will, uh, so here you have distributed context and uh, uh, using statement in C-sharp uh, defines scoping and scope is uh, uh, here and you have a flight ID and uh, I said a flight random source. I, I take uh, uh, weather forecast from random source. All telemetry inside here will be attributed with this distributed tracing. I won't go into details because I want to show something even cooler. Um, so now get ready for this. And this is promised uh, explanation why we needed .NET. For flight ID, uh, it's not only need to be associated with all telemetry inside a single component. You may also want to associate flight ID with every component in distributed application. So you want to know how many database calls failed for specific flight or if uh, some uh, user experience a problem, which flight ID this user was using. So you want to propagate flight ID through the components and you want to do it as automatic as possible and you want to associate all telemetry with this. So what we did in uh, .NET and ISP.NET is first step towards the global mission of Opal telemetry to make telemetry built in in all software. So we uh, took a context propagation as the first step and uh, plug it uh, inside the ISP.NET itself. Let me show you. Okay, for this example, we will need more application because we want to propagate context through the distributed application. So we need more components. First component will, will be uh, Windows form application, uh, long forgotten Windows forms. Um, I have two buttons, red button and green button. Red button will set a, and you, by the way, notice that this application doesn't have any open telemetry references. It's pure, it's uh, like, it's just a framework. So there is API that is not open telemetry API, don't get confused, it's not like open telemetry terms or whatever, it's .NET terms. But we using those APIs and we are using open telemetry APIs and merging them together. It's a, it's a long road. So we, uh, with this API, we can say that this operation, getting weather forecast, is happening with this flight ID, flight ID being red. And this weather high forecast happening with flight ID being green. So let's start this application. But it's not all. Like, I want to make it even more complicated. So let's uh, get a third application in the mix. This is ISP.NET application. Out of the box, it's literally, I created a new template and replaced the controller. So I added logging as well. Um, you see there is no dependency on any external frameworks. And no, uh, it's out of the box ISP.NET application and all ISP.NET 3.0 applications uh, will have this feature out of the box. So this uh, weather forecast controller just proxy all the calls uh, to my backend applications that I showed uh, very, uh, in the very beginning. So let's start this application. And last thing I want to do is, uh, uh, since context, propag uh, context may contain a lot of properties, open telemetry doesn't know which properties to use for as a dimensions for metrics and as a uh, span attributes. So I want to go here in a backend application and I want to uh, tell my uh, application to take flight ID as an attribute for my spans. So trust me, it taking like set attribute on a span. So now I want to start back an application. Finally, I have all three running. And I'll go and click red button and blue, green button. Red button and green button. So red button first, green button second. Hopefully it worked. 
Let's check. Um, and yeah, I want to check it differently. So what happened, uh, this uh, Windows Forms application we form application, send a request to first component, which didn't have any open telemetry enabled, it just propagated context. Uh, this front-end application proxied call to the second application, which had open telemetry, so it collects data, and it takes uh, context out of uh, application. It, what's more interesting is every application on the way also have logging, and this logging is also built-in feature of ISP.NET, and it also traces a uh, 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 transaction of this uh, operation. So let's me, let me go to one of the applications and grab some logs. So in these logs I have trace ID and like I, I'll take this trace ID and I'll go to Zipkin and search for this trace ID. It worked. <laughs> Where is it right? It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I know why. Because I picked, uh, uh, let, me, let me double check. Okay, okay, in the interest of time, I promise you it worked. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so all the context, flight ID, you set in the first uh, application through .NET APIs, uh, automatically converted, uh, translated into properties of spans on the last application. And we will do uh, more of that for other languages as well. So, uh, some like I showed you propagation for uh, HTTP is automatic. Uh, sometimes you need to have propagation for other protocols, and it's not automatic. So we need to have APIs to enable this propagation. Especially, it's important for queue patterns when you uh, take when when this is not a direct RPC uh, correlation. When you need to put messages into put context into the, your messages and propagate the message as a whole. So uh, context will be propagated as a, with a payload of the message. So for this kind of scenarios, you'll need to have custom logic. I have a demo, but I think in the interest of time, I'll switch yeah. to Morgan. Uh, because in reality, we hope you will never need this API. And Morgan will tell you why. Thanks.
it's very important for us to gather this feedback. And uh, if you want to get involved, there is a session tomorrow that you can attend. It's a maintainer's track. We'll talk a little bit about the same, but mostly about how to get engaged into the project, how to uh, participate, and uh, what the benefits you're getting from this project. With that, I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, yeah, thank you. If you have any questions.